Good morning, chat. I hope you guys are having a good day. I'm doing all right. I uh, fortunately didn't have to go into work today, but sorry about missing the upload on Monday. It's just, I, I dropped the ball, I'm gonna be honest. I have been pretty darn busy with work and other stuff. Yeah, I just dropped the ball. I'll make sure to be on top of it for next upload. But besides that, I hope you guys are having a good day. Hope the weekend was good and, uh, you know, you did something interesting. I watched motocross. I watched uh, the crash with Jet Lawrence and how Chase went 40 to first, which is pretty ridiculous. If you guys watched that, that was a ridiculous uh, race. You know, besides that, today, we're going to talk a little bit about the XB70 Valkyrie or the B70, if you want to call it that. The XB-70 was supposed to be like the ultimate bomber for the United States Air Force. It was uh, designed in the 50s and was supposed to take the best aspects of the B-52 Stratofortress and the B-58 Hustler. More specifically, the B-52's intercontinental range and high altitude and large, large bay ability to carry a lot of bombs. It was going to be really good at that right nuclear capability that kind of thing but then also take the speed the you know supersonic speed from the b-58 hustler and being able to avoid uh, a lot of missiles and a lot of uh, different things like that right this thing's specific specifications were that it was going to be able to fly in excess of mach 3 and fly at least at 70,000 feet in the air which is ridiculous this thing was supposed to be completely untouchable it had six general electric yj93 turbojets right delta wing the whole nine yards this thing was incredible it had a 105 foot wingspan it was one of the biggest bombers ever designed and flown uh especially considering it was supersonic we could almost compare it T to put it into reference this thing is more on par in size with the T the tupolev tu-160 blackjack which is currently the largest and heaviest combat aircraft in service. And when conveniently, it's also the fastest. The T-160, you could, you could draw a lot of comparisons between that and the XB-70, but generally the Valkyrie was a more high performance version. Now, the XB-70, what it was supposed to do fundamentally was drop nukes and not get hit. Yeah, it was designed in a time period in the early to mid 1950s when you know missile technology was it was obviously being worked on like missiles have been um, being developed since like the early years of world war ii but they never got advanced enough and never got fast enough or accurate enough same with aircraft that they could really reach those extreme speeds same with the sr-71 blackbird it was considered untouchable as well that's why it was one of the fastest uh manned air breathing aircraft ever designed right um and it was so successful is because of its ability to fly in such a way that you can't get hit. And the XB-70 was supposed to have the same thing. It was really good at that. But then as you see, which I'll talk about, um, the history of it, you know, it started to move into an era where missiles were more readily available and would actually manage to shoot this thing down, which rendered it obsolete. Ultimately, it just became another failed project that was, was some crazy, crazy ass project that uh, some in North American were trying to make in the Cold War because a lot of crazy shit came out of the Cold War. Think the F-104, right? That thing's stupid. We, and what you'll see, the F-104 actually has some connection to this plane, which is very interesting. So let's just start. The XB-70 originally is actually an offshoot of the of Boeing's MX-2145 uh, Boost Glide Bomber Project. And it was... Um, and that was designed to be able to uh, deliver nuclear weapons uh, while it was being developed. And at the time, you know, this is, for reference, this is a time that nuclear weapons were still extremely large and weighed several tons, and you needed to be able to drop them over top, over a country. There weren't really ICBMs yet, but they, you know, they were on their way. And that was another reason that this aircraft became obsolete. So. You know, uh, that was one of the main things is that the United States in the Cold War needed a nuclear capable aircraft that could drop the ever increasing larger bombs that were being developed. Think, you know, Ivy Mike and that kind of thing, like larger, reaching the megatons in size and two, uh, being able to survive the impact. So flying at high enough speeds and high enough altitudes that your aircraft wouldn't be destroyed. Like a good example is uh, for Tsar Bomba. It was that bomb was dropped by a Tu-95 Bear. You know, according to, I don't know who, the Soviet Union, I guess, there was a 50% chance that the Tu-95 would have been destroyed by the shockwave from that explosion. But, you know, 
just try to mitigate that. Um, and of course, the third reason would be to avoid getting shot down, having that insane performance. So we move on to the WS-110A, which um, is when the Air Force was following the development of the MX-2-2145. Uh, and in 1955, they issued General Operational Requirement Number 38, requesting a new bomber, which would basically just combine the B-52 and the B-58, right? And it was originally called Weapon System 125A and was basically just a broad term for a uh, weapon system that was able to carry nuclear weapons, right? And it was originally, apparently, people were thinking it could be a nuclear powered bomber, which is interesting. So they had that in the back of the head. But then, you know, that's uh, the nuclear powered weapon system 125A eventually was scrapped because a nuclear power plane was nowhere in the realm of feasibility back then and moved over into weapon system 110a which was the jet powered version of this fundamental airframe skip ahead you know they're studying and they're working on the airframe and it takes a lot of inspiration interestingly from the lockheed f-104 starfighter in earlier uh concept of the b-70 valkyries airframe and i mean i don't know I understand why, because the F1, the F-104 was in that period, in the, you know, 1950s. It was one of the fastest fighters in the world because it was extremely aerodynamic, but its wings were so small, you could call them horizontal stabilizers. They were ridiculous. So, I mean, I understand why, but I don't really think they, I hope they didn't like take inspiration for where a lot of that speed comes from because it was an extremely you know think of the think of like all the german f-104s like how many of those crashed right then um you know we continued through development and the b-70 was planned to be a high speed high altitude bomber that you know was you know just going to be fast as crap it, and during this period like during the period now we're looking at like late 50s early 60s this is when the only two ways you could actually take out uh, most aircraft or really any uh, bomber really were fighter jets, fighter aircraft or anti-aircraft artillery or AAA anti-air pretty much. And I mean, I would say this was a pretty simple time for a flight because really the, the only, it was only to like, you needed a better, a faster fighter or you needed longer range artillery. And the way to combat that, if you're the bomber, is just to fly faster and higher, right? So it just got, you know, it just pushed to the exact, the, the extremes on both sides for this, right? And, you know, uh, the, the, the higher altitude bombers were created, the um, faster the fighters became, and the larger caliber and bigger and longer range the artillery became, right? So... You know, then we go to missiles, right? Missiles are the big thing. Um, of course, missiles have been in development since as early as 1942, right? They've been thinking for a long time because, you know, back then the Germans, they were thinking that artillery, like anti-air would uh, be rendered obsolete relative, pretty soon because of the fact that, you know, it's just the performance of the aircraft is getting so good that eventually you're just not going to be able to like even see them, right? So we move ahead and you know missile technology was pretty pretty rough it was extremely rough for a very long time and i mean even like when the uh xb70 valkyrie was rendered obsolete it still wasn't that great as, as far as like combat air to air missiles fox 2s like sidewinders were never weren't really great until like a while like de like over a decade after the xb70 valkyrie was like a thought of the past right um, but in the late 1950s, we start to see the first few effective anti-aircraft missiles. And this, you know, changed what uh, this thing could do a lot, right? They were, they were all of a sudden, you know, to going into the 1960s, the B-70 Valkyrie had to contend with missiles that were all over. The Soviets had a ton of them and they were possibly able to actually shoot down on one of these things so this really came to a head in 1960 when a u2 flown by gary powers was shot down by an s5 an s75 Dvina, i think um which was known by the west as an st sa2 guideline but this was the first proof of concept of a missile shooting down an aircraft 
a very high performance aircraft, mind you. The U-2 was the fly, fly, highest flying air breathing plane in the world at that time. So this became a massive issue. Uh, so what so what the Air Force chose to do to combat this is they changed the doctrine, right? Because um, the XB-70 was originally supposed to be a very high altitude, high speed aircraft. So what they ch decided to do, because the radar system on air to air missiles was line of sight back then, they decided to fly at low altitudes, which would combat that, right? We'd see, um, we'd see XB-70 Valkyries going from flying at 70,000 feet to significantly lower, where the ground would uh, cause them to, you know, not get targeted or shot down. Now, the issue with this that really caused a problem was that the, um, obviously the valkyrie it has that mach 3 capability but only at altitude at low out at low speeds it couldn't even go so it couldn't even be supersonic right so it became a massive problem that it was it it became that the at the xb70 was very efficient for what it was designed to do at high altitudes but at low altitudes it was wildly inefficient and it was a terrible plane and it, functionally it would go the same speed as a b b52 at low altitudes and have the same performance and there's also the issue that you can't drop a nuke from that low of an altitude right it's you just can't so that became a whole issue so you know as these are starting to take a toll on the program just some incidents happened in the mid 60s that caused um the xb70 to be you know discontinued and canceled by uh, kennedy and um, Carl Vinson in the 11th hour White House Rose Garden Agreement. So that's the end of that. That thing's gone. Um, but uh, it did have a little bit of operational history, not more like testing, but um, I'll just run through that. This is um, according to, so this is according to Wikipedia. Um, it's cited to be from, uh, written by someone called Pace in 1990. I don't know. Uh, exactly. Sorry, I don't have any like proper sources. But um, the longest flight ever done by an XB-70 was three hours and forty minutes. The highest speed they reached was two thousand twenty miles an hour, which does qu uh, qualify as Mach three. It was three point oh eight. Um, the highest altitude was seventy four thousand feet, and they were in Mach three for thirty two minutes. So, and they reached Mach three in ten flights, right? So through this development period, they did have a couple of variants, right? The XB-70A was the main stamp, like the main line test platform that they were using, right? That's what did the most flights. It did 83 of them and flew for 160 hours and 16 minutes. Um, yeah, so then the, of course they had uh, some other stuff like the XB-70B, which was a, a modernized advanced uh, prototype that was canceled um the yb70 was a planned pre-production version the rs70 was a reconnaissance and strike version and then the b70a was supposed to be the production version of the valkyrie which 65 of them were planned to be ordered but you know just a little bit of an interesting thing let's go through um one of the inciting incidents near the end of its development that caused it to be canceled along with the course that you know technological issues but uh there, there were like some small incidents where like say um a piece of the wing broke off in uh 65 also 1965 um one of them went mach 3 but heat uh heat and stress uh related damage the damage to honeycomb panels leading uh causing the leading edge of the left wing missing which made it extremely dangerous and limited that aircraft to being able to only fly at mach 2.5 but the big one is on June 8th, 1966, an XB-70A number two, because there were only two built, was in close formation with four other aircraft. It, they were an F-4 Phantom, an F-5, a T-38, and an F-104 Starfighter. And they were there for a photo shoot for General Electric for a promotional picture because all those aircraft uh, carry General Electric engines in them, right? And it was being photographed by a Learjet 23. Uh, contracted by Learjet but um what happened was is the um during after the photo shoot so they got all their pictures the f-104 actually um in formation drifted into the xb-70's right wing tip flipped over and uh rolled over the top of the valkyrie before striking the before hitting the bomber's vertical stabilizer and moving over onto the left wing the f-104 ex then blew up and it destroyed the vertical stabilizers and damaged its left wing. And then 
but funnily enough, despite the loss of both vertical stabilizers on this thing, it flew straight for 16 seconds before then it entered, entered an uncontrollable spin and crashed in um, uh, California. So, unfortunately, uh, there were two people that died here. Joe Walker, who flew the F-104, and Carl Cross, who was a co-pilot um, of the XB-70. Uh, Al White, the, uh, the pilot of the XB-70, uh, did eject, but he was uh, seriously injured. And his arm apparently was crushed. Jesus Christ. But, um, you know, that was a very, you know, catastrophic incident. There are pictures. I'll try to can put one up. But you can see um, how the XB-70 is missing. The the left vertical stabilizer is completely gone. It looks the other, like the other one was sheared a little bit, um, but is still partially there. And then you can see just more damage. And, of course, you know, the, um, uh, the T-38, F-5, and F-4 still in formation while you see the f-104 just burning completely destroyed in the back that that was a, that's you know pretty ridiculous um but yeah uh that's really it uh as far as the xb70 goes it's a really it's a really cool concept i think it really evokes that 1960s aesthetic not right not aesthetic but like you know what kind of crap they were building in the 50s and 60s like i always say if i had to be alive during any period of uh aviation's history it would be during it'd be like 1959 or something because then i could be able to live through all the 60s and see all the crazy crap that happened because that'd be sick um but you know it really does that and if you want to see any of these there is um the valkyrie av1 is on display at the national museum of the united states air force at wright patterson air force base near dayton ohio so if you want to go see that and then you're in you know in the uh, midwest area Take a look at that. I was gonna go here um, when I went out on a trip to Oshkosh in 2021 uh, for the air show, but I never got a chance. But it's there, and man, it, you can just see how humongous this bomber was. It's really incredible. But yeah, that's really all I had for today, guys. I hope you had a good day. Um, I hope you are having a good day, whatever time of the day it is. Go have a, go have a sip of water. Go eat something delicious. Um, and yeah, chat. You know, type one. I hope you have a good, good day. Please subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed this video, and like like it as well if you really, really uh, I don't know, tickle your <laughs> tickle your fancy bone. <laughs> I, I don't know, like just uh, do it, do it, because I need money, and I'm gonna buy expensive things with the money. Let's see, you know, chat sneak peek. Let's see how much money I've made on this channel. You want to see? You want to see? Let's see. Uh. I've made, oh, hello, now hold on, okay, so we've made like, I've made three bucks, hey, chat, type one to that, I made three dollars, so I mean, yeah, if you guys are interested, then please, uh, you know, just subscribe, keep watching, and uh, I hope you guys have a good day.